You are listening to Amphory's Unleash Opportunity webinar series, where we bring together thought leaders to explore the latest trends affecting open and sustainable trade. Hello and welcome to our second in the series of Amphory's Unleash Opportunity webinars. Today we will talk about climate risk and resilience for women in the agricultural sector. During this one-hour webinar, we will examine the challenges and vulnerabilities faced by women due to climate change at farm level, as well as bus the business case for promoting gender equality in the agricultural sector. My name is Stephanie Luong. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at Amphori, and I will be moderating this webinar with our expert speakers. Before proceeding, I would like to share with you some logistics. First of all, the entire audience is on mute. If you do have any questions, please post them in the chat box located on the right hand side of your screen. Please post also your questions throughout the webinar and we will do our best to answer them at the end. This webinar is recorded and it will be sent to you afterwards. Uh, you will also be able to access it on our web, web, uh, website as well as the PowerPoints that will be shown during this webinar. Now let me introduce you to the speakers. We are pleased to welcome Shahamin Zaman, CEO of the CSR Center in Bangladesh, which provides information resources and advisory services on corporate responsibility in Bangladesh. The CSR Center is a key partner from FORI for its Women Empowerment Program, as we work together on gender equality at factory floor level. Shamin is also the Vice Chair of the Amphory Stakeholder Advisory Council and today she will present some of the key challenges for women in the agricultural sector. We will then hear from Katie Abbott, Associate at BSR, a non-profit organization which supports sustainable business strategies and solutions through consulting, research and cross-sector collaboration. She will showcase the work of BSR and its member through a number of initiatives, including the Business Action for Women Collaboration. Last but not least, the webinar will feature Christina arescock burling who is the Sustainability Manager at the Amphori member company Axe Food. She will provide details on a specific collaboration project initiated by Axe Food, aiming to improve working conditions for smallholders, particularly women in villages in Pakistan. And we will end the webinar with a Q&A session among all our speakers. As we discuss climate risk and resilience for women in the agricultural sector, let me introduce Amphori and show our representation and potential impact in this area. We work, Amphori, with more than 2,300 retailers, importers and brand companies to enable them to improve the social and environmental performance in their global supply chains. We also engage at the local and international level to help shape the policy environment to support their global trading operations. Under Amphori, we offer three products, Amphori BSCI, Amphori BPI, and Amphori Advocacy. Amphori BSCI supports companies to drive sustainability by monitoring and improving working condition in the supply chain. Amphori BPI aims to support companies to improve the environmental performance in their supply chain. And last but not least, Amphori Advocacy support in leveraging and shaping a policy environment, voicing the values of open and sustainable trade. Together, our activities aim to contribute to the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to drive positive social and environmental change. We have started defining the link between each SDG and Amphoris activities. Concerning the topic of this webinar, we see a clear link to the activities of our members who can contribute to SDG 13, Climate Action, and SDG 5, Gender Equality. Through food and primary production, the agricultural sector represents a significant share of our activities, including 500 members and 3,500 factories and farms. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, women make up to 43% of the agricultural labor force. For us, this means our work could represent an estimate average total of 215,000 women at primary production level. So at Amphori, we, we aim to contribute to the empowerment of women by improving social and environmental conditions in the supply chain in many ways. Specifically, we launched this year and actually last month the Women's Empowerment Program in three countries, India, China and Bangladesh. And we aim to provide a platform for companies to address the negative impacts in their supply chain. 
For Amphori, the issue of climate risk and resilience for women in the agricultural sector remains exploratory territory. We are at the start of our journey and are looking forward to examining the challenges and potential solutions with our expert speakers. So on this note, I would like to welcome uh, Shahamin Zaman, who, as I was saying before, is the CEO of the CSS Center in Bangladesh. Shahamin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to our participants who have joined us today for this very interesting topic on climate change, women, and sustainability. So I would like to uh, just start off by why, why do we we talk about gender you know, in the recent times. And gender is actually a cross-cutting issue uh, in the sense that it, uh, you know, before the gender dy dynamics were not even discussed in the last you know, 10, 15 years, and it has become more prevalent in uh, the modern age. Uh, we feel that women's uh, contribution in each field, in each sector is very, very important, and we have to take their perspective to talk about uh, change, to talk about sustainable development, and especially when we talk about climate risks and climate change, because the women in themselves in rural areas are very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to the climate ch change issues uh, when there's natural calamities like floods, disasters like earthquakes, uh, droughts. Women are the ones that have to take care of the household. They have a dual responsibility at or not only inside the home but outside the home at the farm level and we need to look at their perspectives as well when we look at climate change and how it impacts women when we see that the risks actually multiply because women are uh, having to do the mid-level work at the field level but the decision making power still lies with their male counterparts even though the bulk of the work is taken up by women, they are, they are the ones that have the, uh, they are involved in reproductive uh, initiative as well as they are also looking after the household and the family at large. But at the same instance, they are contributing to our economic development, but yet they are undervalued. And we must not, uh, you know, forget that their, their, uh, their contribution as a productive agent of change must be acknowledged. What I would like to say is that why are they important in the value chain? Even today, in, we see in different countries globally, and especially in the developing nations in Asia and Southeast Asia, that even though they play such an uh, important role, their role is not, it's undervalued and it's not paid. Wages are still low for women all across the world. And uh, we, we need to think of issues of equality and uh, we need to also address these issues. Um, the, main, the majority of the population, if we look at the agricultural sector, women are driving uh, the agricultural sector. They are working in the field level. They are working at, they're trying to market their produce, yet they cannot, because due to certain mobility, they cannot actually take their uh, products to the market. So if you look at the climate risks that are associated with this, that over the years, climate change is having significant impact on the communities. And this, ha this is due to adverse weather conditions, global warming, which we have seen recently, the calamities that have happened, earthquakes are happening in Nepal, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and other countries, floods have been recurring. And this actually creates a havoc for the normal life of a woman in the villages, in the agricultural sector, because it has uh, a negative impact on soil fertility. It has a negative impact on the water usage and uh, the other natural resources. If we want to manage these efficiently, we have to reduce the negative impacts of climate change. And if we want to do that, we need to actually consider how women are engaged and what their perspectives are, because the, the whole issue of gender varies between men and women. Men are impacted in a different way than women are. And farmers in the communities need to understand that and predict 
the risks that are involved and also determine what crops to be grown in the geographical areas because each each um, each uh, geographical location has different soil fertility they have different uh, rainfalls so different uh, areas so we need to also understand what type of crops can grow in the agricultural sector and how are women related to those those activities at the field level uh, farmers in communities also um, we see that we t we talk of them as homogeneous but they're not you know women and men are different and they are contributing differently and rural women are more vulnerable uh, in climate related incidences next please next slide so if we are try to understand how we can mitigate this climate change through better planning we need to create coping mechanisms and often we see at the policy level interventions, it's we take the whole group as one, the community as one, as the population as one. But we need to look at it from a different perspective. We have to have better uh, gender coping mechanisms. We have to look at it at a gender from a gender lens. Uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which create global warming. We look at efficient water usage or resource use, usage energy usage, conservation of energy, because women look at things differently than men. If we look at the identification of alternative sources of energy, we know these days a lot of the rural homes have solar energy. Now, how are women coping with those initiatives, these innovative ideas? The identification of also the, uh, the changing of mindsets. We need to also think of how we can uh, according to SDG 12, how can we do, go towards responsible production and consumption? So it requires a coordinated effort to reduce these sort of vulnerabilities and to look at how can we mitigate these climate cha change that, uh, that creates negative impact to the, not only to the community, but also overall. And we need to uh, sort of initiate participatory action programs with communities. So the whole thing of policy level planning that used to happen 10 years ago, if we look at it from the bottom up approach, we need to engage the community, but we have been engaging community as one, but we need to look at it through our gender lens, introducing innovative technologies and knowledge sharing, how women are impacted, how men are impacted. This will create further change. Next, please. Next slide. So adaptation is a very important part of climate change in the agriculture sector and to look at women's participation. Uh, I want to just quote here Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and former UN Commissioner for Human Rights. She said, climate change is the greatest threat to human rights in the 21st century. And people who are marginalized or poor, women and indigenous communities are being disproportionately affected by climate impacts. So if we look at her statement, it is really uh, interesting to see that we can no longer ignore the, the rights of women in the situation of disasters because they're totally different than what, what is needed by the men. Agriculture is an important sector for most of the developing countries and a majority of our population live there. Uh, it's highly dependent on these weather conditions. If we look at Asia, uh, like a lot of the women in the rural areas, they're engaged in livestock rearing, they're engaged in poultry farming, water management, and other resource management in their, from their regular household chores. But why don't we try to engage them in a broader way, upscale their activities? Why not? You know, they are doing it at a micro level, at a household level. We can actually explore where there is possibility to look at it at a macro level. Rural women face a lot of challenges in adapting climate change impacts. Uh, it's basically due to lack of knowledge. They are so limited. Most of these rural women in uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, they, they have limited uh, formal training, formal knowledge. They have no access to resources or assets. They don't have bank accounts. They, they don't know about, uh, you know, financial, they do not have financial literacy. They don't have access to banks or financial institutions. 
And of course, even when they're working at, at the field level, they're engaging in the production cycle, they are not integrated in the vertical, uh, vertical horizontal integration of the production cycle. And of course, they don't have decision-making power. So when we're talking in the modern day about technology transfer in the agricultural sector, we're talking about mass scale production levels. We're talking about standardization. These are where the, this, uh, this critical mass is sort of missing. So climate change impacts vary between men and women. Women play a significant role in creating climate resistant agriculture in rural economies. And we have to acknowledge that. Next, please. Slide. So how, uh, what are the ways in developing countries, which have mostly in the agriculture sector have more than 50% women, how are they coping? What is, what is the impact that women have? Uh, if we look at the, what are the barriers they're facing, we, we have to look at the four aspects of it. One is the economic of it. The economics of it is that they're not being paid. They're either paying, being paid low wages or they're not being paid or acknowledged at all for their economic contribution. This has a negative impact on GDP growth. And if we look at the social side of it, they're double burden because they are looking after the household, the children, and they are looking at the field level uh, produce. And they're in helping their spouses or their male family members to uh, uh, with the production cycle, yet they have no decision-making power. They are also, really, also, if you look at the traditions and the cultures, most are male-dominated societies where women do not have a voice. They do not have a voice politically. They do not have a voice at household level. So it's very pertinent that we must engage women and look at their perspective when we look at gender balance, when we look at the agricultural sector and their contribution. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So what's the responsibility of business towards women? Businesses need to adopt preparedness measures for climate change inclusion. They need to develop climate resilience strategies within their business plans. Businesses can, can conduct stakeholder mapping to identify challenges of climate impact, risk of their supply chains. And of course, business must realize that women require gender-friendly environment and programs to achieve food security and smart production cycles as well as build resilient households and communities. Next, please. So uh, if you look at the gender-based resilience action, applying a gender lens to resilience activities can help companies develop innovative tools. We, we actually need to sit with the women and find out that what are their needs? What are the areas of challenge? How can we support them in our programs, our projects? We need to anticipate, we need to understand them and accommodate their views. And this will actually help us to have rapidly recovering climate action. Next. So we need, if we look at where we can have a holistic gender-based resilient program, we need to involve women in climate resilience planning we need to also foster innovation in climate resilience. Next. Next, please. And we need to increase women's knowledge of the land cultivation, usage, ownership, create sustainable agricultural methods, make women experts in natural resource management and agricultural management. Women will be more likely to adapt to sustainable practices as they have access to information, to tools, technology and definitely capacity building. This is where we need to put our eggs in one basket because it's it, most of the cases because of the lack of knowledge or the lack of putting things into a formal approach, the capacity building, the skill development needs to happen at uh, for uh, with a gender lens. And this may include leadership and resource management. It may include usage of innovative technology water management, crop diversification, better management of energy saving, 
to uh, initiatives. Yes, next, please. Next slide. Yeah. So I would like to just also highlight that ensuring internal policies are in practice, introduce gender sensitive climate resilience program to provide women with access to gender relevant training. Many of the training is just mainstream training. We need to look at it at a gender lens and technology usage, better financial management, leadership, financial literacy to strengthen stability in agricultural production and improve economic opportunities for women. Next, please. Next slide. We need to enable women to effectively respond to climate-related events by linking them with local networks. Many times, it, 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 we see when there's a flood or there's a, a cyclone or a hurricane in the rural areas, we see that women work in silos. They have little opportunity with the, uh, with the household chores and the field chores. They do not link up with local networks. Very few of them do. And we need to actually give them that access. Local networks and local NGOs or local uh, initiatives can help them in uh, carrying on a process where they are prepared for climate change and uh, negative impacts. And policy lobbying by removing sy systematic barriers that impact women's livelihood to give them decision-making power and land inheritance rights. Um, practically, in most of the countries in South Asia, we see there's, there is a gap in the land inheritance rights. These are all male-dominated, and we see that very many, very often, even if there are good policies in place, it's not being implemented. So these rights need to be ensured. We need to have uh, the, the rights of the women ensured. We have to hear the voices of women in rural areas in engaging with a lot of, uh, a lot of traditional knowledge that they have, how to share that knowledge, how to be productive agents of change. Next, please. So I just want to end by one um, quote by John Delaney, an American politician and business leader. Climate change is the environmental challenge of this generation. It is imperative that we act before it's too late. I also want to just say that um, as I'm 40 co-chair, I also believe that the BEPI business uh, initiative that I'm 40 does have is actually safeguarding the environment, helping companies where they can introduce BEPI methods, where they can safeguard the environment with environmental standards and actually have more profits and reduce their risks. With that, I thank you all very much for listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shahamin, for this very inspiring presentation and also the sense of urgency you gave to this webinar. Indeed, uh, there, it's time for action before it's too late. I think you really described very well the challenges that climate change pose on the agricultural sector and how women could enable businesses to develop successful climate resilience strategies and planning and what they would need to really contribute to support the businesses. Um, well, now I think it's time that we, we move on to Katie Abbott. So Katie works for BSR uh, projects related to women empowerment, the SDGs and human rights. Um, Katie, you will present the business case for empowering women through climate resilient supply chains. Um, before before we, we give the floor to Katie, I would like to remind everybody, please do not hesitate to post your questions through the webinar. Just use the chat box on the right side of your screen. Katie, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and as she just said, I'm here to talk about the business case and some of the ways that businesses can take action to empower women through climate resilient supply chains. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a brief introduction to BSR. We are a global nonprofit membership organization. Um, our mission is right here next to the giant number one. Uh, we work with business to create a just and sustainable world. 
And we do this through consulting, research, and facilitate, facilitating cross-sector collaboration. We have over 265 member companies, which range across different industries, and I'll show you a few examples in a moment. Um, and we work across six core areas, climate change, human rights, inclusive economy, supply chain sustainability, sustainability management, and women's empowerment. And today we are going to look at where our work on climate and women's empowerment overlap. Next slide. The BSR, we have a few initiatives focusing on women and climate, and there are two that I'm going to highlight here. Uh, first on the left is Business Action for Women, which is one of our collaborations focusing on driving progress for women broadly. But one of the main topics that we look at um, is empowering women to lead on climate resilience. And the second on the right is our series of six Nexus reports. Um, and you can see the six logos across the top in the green box. Um, and these are all aimed at business to drive resilience inside their company across supply chains and with vulnerable communities. And we've been releasing these reports over the last uh, month or so, and we'll continue to release the next two um, throughout the end of the year. But just a couple of weeks ago, we launched our climate and women report. So I'm going to share some of that research. Uh, next slide, please. So briefly, this is an overview of business action for women. Um, you can see our participants on the bottom right. Um, so uh, Caring, I mean Fisher, Coca-Cola, et cetera. Um, we have 14 members in this collaboration right now. And they are all working together to figure out corporate solutions to drive progress for women. So these efforts focus on three main areas are what we call action clusters. And you can see in the green box um, that one of the three focus areas is positioning women as powerful change agents on climate resilience. Uh, next slide, please. So taking a closer look at that action cluster, um, our member companies worked together to come up with this vision and impact statement for the cluster to work toward. Um, and you can see that while the vision emphasizes women and agricultural communities and their access to natural resources and livelihoods, the longer term impact for our company gets right at the business case. Um, so the impact is that companies will have access to agricultural supply chains that are more climate resilient. So for us um, and for our members, and as uh, Shahamin was talking about, um, women in climate is a relatively new and developing topic over the last decade. So for us, this is an iterative process to figure out where we are going and how exactly to get there. Um, and since the Women in Climate Cluster launched last year, we focused on um, building the foundation and the groundwork through internal research um, and just starting to build awareness and working with our members. We developed a global mapping of organizations around the world that are working on this topic. Um, and we also focused on a business case toolkit for companies to use to communicate about women and climate internally. And now we're looking towards our advocacy efforts with companies as well as assessment tools and other ways to move this work forward. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so jumping into our recent uh, Women and Climate Nexus report. Um, so a lot of the work of Business Action for Women, that collaboration actually informed this research. And the report is available on BSR's website. So I hope all of you go and download it and read it and please send us your thoughts. We would love to hear them. Um, so we start with a focus on the human dimension of climate change. And uh, as Shahamin was saying, we know that while climate change threatens people's access to resources, food, livelihoods, water, it does not impact people equally. Um, the risk is not the same for everyone, so therefore we argue that solutions need to recognize this. Um, and women especially face unique challenges due to systemic barriers that you can see here. Uh, so we highlight discriminatory laws, uh, access to financial and technological resources, uh, unequal roles in unpaid care, 
a lack of voice in decision making, et cetera. And these barriers limit women's ability to effectively prepare for and respond to climate impacts. Next slide. Oh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so for us, looking at how to present the business case, it's important to not only state the risk and how climate change disproportionately affects women, but also the opportunity side um, for women to play a role in climate solutions. Um, and we purposely made the opportunity box here much bigger. Um, so in agricultural supply chains, we point out that women are a critical part of the workforce. So therefore it's impossible to build climate resilience without them. Um, and that climate change magnifies gender inequalities. And again, women are disproportionately affected. But most importantly, women bring unique skills, experience, knowledge, perspectives um, that can drive innovation for climate resilience for companies. Uh, so for example, we outline all the business risks um, due to those barriers mentioned earlier and how climate change uh, exacerbates existing challenges related to these barriers and um, presents a high material risk for many companies by impeding supply chains from reaching their full productive potential and leading to financial risks, operational risks, and workforce um, instability. So we also emphasize women as change agents. And one example is how women have been stewards of the land for generations in many regions, and they are um, increasingly the primary custodians and food producers, and how this local knowledge of the land can make women experts in natural resource management, um, and also, as Shahin mentioned, they also play an important role in the household and gathering household resources, um, which those habits are critical to climate resilience and preventing environmental degradation. Um, they also play an important role in community dynamics um, and so on. So the narrative here that we emphasize with the business case is that despite facing greater risks, women stand out because they have this potential uh, to help society address climate impacts and for business this drives productivity, protects their access to raw materials, um, increases financial stability, and so on. So it makes good business sense um, to include and empower women in the development and implementation of climate strategies. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, next slide. And so uh, after recognizing the business, oh, one slide back, sorry. <laughs> uh, after recognizing the business case um, and recognizing the potential of women to play such an important role in developing climate resilient solutions, solutions, we provide this framework, Act Enable Influence, as a starting point for intervention. So we see that companies can drive solutions in three main ways. First, by taking action in areas under their direct control within their own operations and throughout the value chain. Um, so this means putting women at the center of policies and trainings, um, establishing a deeper understanding internally of the relationship of women and climate resilience, uh, making sure that women receive input, finance, technology, et cetera, to meet their needs. And then companies can also enable an influence. Um, and this is all about influence enabling and influencing other companies and partners and policymakers to act at the intersection of climate resilience and women. So to enable, this means uh, collaborating with local networks and women's organizations and across industry groups to share solutions. So an example of this would be uh, our business action for women collaboration. And for influence, companies can advocate for fundamental women's rights. Uh, Nestle, for example, works to ensure women's land rights are recognized and respected through stakeholder engagement and advocacy efforts, um, working directly in communities that are impacted by the company's business activities. And finally, next slide, please. To bring this all together, in the report, we feature a number of case studies across the Act Enable Influence Framework, and I'm going to share just one. Um, Mondelez empowers women to create more sustainable cocoa growing communities through its Cocoa Life program. And the program is increasing women's access to farm inputs and land ownership and more. Um, but Mondelez highlights the business case and why they're doing this. And so the company has a goal to source all of the cocoa sustainably. 
Um, and specifically, they highlight how communities where women's voices are listened to see rising incomes and stronger family finances and increased school attendance, which translates to greater economic success and more sustainable cocoa farming. So for them, for Mondelez, um, it's in their best interest to empower women in their farming communities. And so we have additional case studies that are included um, in the report so that you can uh, see how from the challenges to the business case to this Act Enable Influence framework, we can um, all take action and move forward on climate resilience in women. So thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much, Katie, um, for your presentation. In, you very much went already in more concrete aspects, how businesses, whatever, however small or big, can actually take action when it comes to women empowerment uh, through this uh, framework that you described, Act Enable Influence. And I'm sure that we have many listeners who are going to look at the different Nexus reports to, to read more um, concrete stories like the case study that you just presented. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Christina areskog burling from the Amphorey member company Axfood. Christina will present the work of uh, Axfood when it comes to uh, tackle gender and climate issues in the supply chain uh, with a very specific practical case study. Christina, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and uh, all listeners. Thank you. Uh, I'm a, a sustainability manager at Axfood. Uh, we are a food retailer in uh, Sweden, uh, one of the three bigger food retailers in Sweden. And of course, we have thousands of uh, articles in our shops and uh, uh, food from all over the world. So we really have to uh, prioritize in what we're working with in the uh, seeing to the risks in the supply chains. And uh, when we uh, started off this work uh, several years ago, we found that uh, rice, of course, is uh, uh, one of the riskful uh, categories um, that we wanted to work more with. So I will tell you about a project that we work with now in Pakistan, uh, where our basmati rice is sourced. So next slide, please. Um, we started off uh, with a um, risk analysis back in 2014-15 uh, with the Maplecroft and we saw that it was really a lot of issues. Uh, gender inequalities was absolutely one of them but also climate uh, risks um, and climate here is both that rice is of course in the production is causing a climate uh, uh, CO2 effluence and also the uh, vulnerability of the climate um, uh, uh, changes that is actually causing uh, you need the resilience uh, um, for the people in Pakistan. Uh, rice farmers are affected in that way. But uh, also other human rights violations, of course, was found. So we thought that uh, the, here we have uh, it's also further down in the tiers. You must think of that the rice farmers, the smallholders are maybe four or five tiers down uh, from us. So we had to work with our suppliers, our first tier supplier, and we reached out to Oxfam. And then uh, they started a... a pre-study and after that we also joined the bigger CEDA financed uh, Asian project called GRACI, uh, Gender Transformative and Responsible Agribusiness in Southeast Asia. It's actually covering seven countries and uh, many other products than rice. Uh, so we're like, um, uh, you get learning from, from the other uh, countries as well. We try to use much of the same thinking. Uh, but the aim here in Pakistan uh, was to uh, improve conditions for the smallholders. Uh, and the main tool to do it was uh, bottom up, like uh, actually organizing the growers in the grower organizations. And the first phase, it was 10 villages. And now we will reach out to, to more villages. 
uh, we visited in January 2018 and actually the result was over expectations then and now we got the report from the first one and a half year so already now we can see uh, improved conditions and especially I would say that the the uh, the results for the women participation in the program is actually uh, very successful in that way. So next slide please. Uh, here you can see where we are now. It's in the west uh, north uh, Paki uh, part of Pakistan, outside Lahore in the countryside, Muridiki district. Uh, of course, basmati rice, for the, those who know, it's uh, either uh, from uh, Pakistan Punjab or India Punjab. So it's always in the same region, uh, which is actually a, a benefit for the project because then we know that we need to source the basmati rice from this region. So we decided now in the project period to also uh, uh, use only the area of Punjab, Pakistan. Otherwise, it's very common that food retailers source from uh, the whole area of Punjab, both in India and Pakistan. But we decided to, to stick to, to this area where we also have the project. OK, so next slide, please. Uh, the women's situation, which we found out in the pre-study, and uh, yeah, we know more and more about it. Uh, it's actually quite uh, uh, much problems. So uh, it's especially in the seasonal agriculture work because the smallholders are also often uh, seasonal laborers at the bigger farms. So during uh, season, the women, I mean, they both have their own fields. But, uh, I mean, in their family, and as uh, Shamin and the Katya has described, it's exactly the same here, that they do not often have the ownership of the land, so it's in the families, and the women are doing most of the work, and then they are also working at the other fields. And there they are extremely vulnerable. Uh, it's... Uh, 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 examples or uh, information about sexual harassment, uh, because they are going out uh, to the fields in other uh, neighboring villages or quite yeah some far, further away and then they live uh, in a shelter or tent that is maybe given by the bigger land lords and then they they are actually very vulnerable and could be uh, yeah they could be affected by sexual harassment and so there is also uh, unequal payments for women work is almost sometimes it's said even half of the men uh, and this is also in the processing, so there we we also have added information. So, and there is a lack of uh, healthcare sanitation. They told about you know snake uh, bites and all these different things, and and the lack of health and sanitation. So next slide, please. Uh, climate issues. It's uh, I mean it's heavily um, affected in this area. Uh, I think it's. So, um, it's the different uh, changes in rain patterns, and so it's both uh, floodings and, and drought and different, they don't, like many places in the, in the world, they say that they don't recognize the, the, the weather pattern, which, of course, is a big problem for farmers. And also the groundwater risk to deplete in this area. And, you know, rice is actually taking a lot of uh, irrigation of water. So uh, uh, it's an urgent need to change techniques to, for more, more water saving and also change of crops. Uh, this project we um, uh, cooperated with the Rice Research Institute and the Agricultural University in uh, Faisalabad and they did different studies uh, around the climate resilience as well and uh, the idea is to assist the smallholders to adopt to sustainable rice platform standards. It's the SRP standard coming now for rice which also includes the, the climate um, uh, re resilience and the climate uh, reduction uh, and as well as water. Water is of course one of the key elements in, in this work also. So next slide please. Uh, what, what we saw in the project is that the women uh, farmers and the smallholders uh, 
the one of the key problems is they don't have access to market. Uh, it was mentioned earlier also. Uh, please go back there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we, what the project do actually is to get access to the market, uh, get the, also the women to be involved in the business. So break bondage to the middleman. Often the middleman is in the village even. So it's a women empowerment and climate adaption and also water man management. Uh, so we want to, of course, link this to our. Uh, to the business also, the sourcing of the rice. Right now we don't know exactly that we buy from these uh, villages, but uh, we hope in the phase two, which we go into now, that we uh, more and more can link our uh, business. So the goal must be, of course, to, to create a real sustainable trade with uh, no uh, uh, need for the uh, outside aid or support like uh, the product is now. So you can take next, please. can take next next slide please uh, we visited the area in January 2018 and uh, what's really interesting was that uh, women always led the meetings uh, actually it's 65 percentage women in the uh, grower organizations and in 50 percent of them they are in the executive bodies so they are led by women and uh, you could really see when they were speaking in the meetings, they were the ones who uh, opened the meetings. Uh, Pakistan being one of the second worst country to be a woman <laughs> considered. Uh, so you could really notice that it's, you can see here, the uh, women are sitting on one side and the men are sitting on the other side. But here you, uh, I was surprised that the women really spoke up and they took the lead uh, in many ways. We could see that and we, by talking to both women and men. And uh, now in the phase two project, we will uh, focus, uh, still keep the gender focus and the climate adaption uh, will be even stronger in the coming uh, phase two, which is actually three years program. It's uh, in the picture above, you can see also the social mobilizers. Uh, one woman and one man is uh, actually going to the villages on a daily basis and uh, are like working with the women and men. Next slide please. Yeah, here again you just see pictures of this very div divided world, like men on one side, women on one side. Uh, but actually we were also asking the men, how did they find this uh, when the women were speaking up, speaking up and they were taking part of the, you know, uh, growers organization and getting involved in business and, but they said, uh, but that's also of course when we were visiting, maybe I, I, I'm sure that there are also conflicts coming with this, but it's probably um, constructive conflicts which is needed to have dialogue around it. But they said that, yes, but now we get other perspectives and they, they thought it was a positive thing. So, yeah, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it's also challenging, of course. So next picture. Next slide, please. And here also you can see the women were, uh, you know, like I said, they were uh, holding the meetings and uh, speaking out uh, about their problems and they made their own plans and the, the uh, outline of the project has been also uh, with, with their perspective in mind. Next, please. We have to go. You can take next. We also try to communicate to consumers about it because, uh, of course, we need to make a business case of it. Uh, uh, here it's both on our rice cakes, which we also introduce now. We are part of the project in Cambodia with the same uh, target, the same goal, the same project. Uh, we communicate on the packages, both for the rice cakes and the rice. And we communicate in uh, websites and try to get uh, information out. But we could do it more and better, I'm sure. But <laughs> we, that's needed also, of course. <clears throat> Next one. I think that's one of the last, uh, the last slides, actually. 
but maybe one more slide so we can take questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, Christina, it's taking a while to load. We have some technical uh, problems, but would you like the slide with communicating to the consumers that we just saw a few seconds ago? Yes, but I think actually now it's just the end. It's just the last. So I think we can uh, go to, because we also only have nine minutes left of the whole. <laughs> so yes. it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Really a great case study, very inspiring also to demonstrate how focusing on issues such as, well, in this case of specifically basmati rice production, but working together on climate change in the agricultural sector can really reveal the positive um, contribution that women can bring as agent of change. Sorry for the delay. We had indeed uh, here some technical issues, so it takes it took a bit of time to um, to see the different slide one after the other. And indeed, we, we have only a few minutes before the end of this webinar. First of all, thank you to, to all of our experts for your valuable contribution. It was really an important discussion. And uh, we have received a few questions. Um, people who who are listening, the listeners, you can still post your question again if you want in the chat box. Maybe already one from my side for, for Shamina. I think with all the things we heard right now this afternoon and also the sense of uh, urgency you gave us with this quote, um, this quote yeah, that you mentioned, uh, my question would be, what, what is the additional support that you really believe is needed today from the global community to advance this issue uh, quicker, faster. Shahamin? Yes, thank you, Stephanie, for the question. Uh, I think what needs to happen, a lot of dialogue and discussion has been happening at the global level and at national level, but everything does not work if it's top down. There has to be a bottom up approach to it. And I think policies and discussions and dialogues and sharing must happen at the field level to create that change because we all need to be on the same wavelength. And uh, most of the discussions actually do not take into account what farmers are saying, what the rural people are saying, what the communities are saying. So I think in order to have uh, direct action and implementation, we need to think from bottom-up approach. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I would like, well, actually to ask maybe to, to Christina, the same question from, from a business perspective. What do you think is needed today to advance uh, faster on this, on the issue of women empowerment and climate change? Uh, I actually think that for, if I just think of the experience we have had, I feel that we really need to reach out to cooperate because we cannot do this kind of projects which we uh, have done now, for example, in, in Pakistan without the NGO sector. Mm. And also in the project, they have uh, really worked in a good way with the like multi-stakeholder platform, with the politicians, it's lobbying, the, the local governments and the uh, uh, we have to use the, you know, the, the uh, policies and the um, networks and the infrastructure which is there, but giving access to, to women and smallholders and the most vulnerable groups. And that we can only do by cooperating. So uh, uh, we need NGOs and we need brave companies in some way to, to reach out in a, more than what we do, I, I feel, in the business community. Mm, Christina, actually we have several listeners who have been very interested by this last slide you show with communicating to the consumers and are wondering what were the reaction from the consumer side on that communication on the packaging? Did you see any impact on the sales of uh, basmati rice? 
Hmm. I'm sorry to say that we cannot see that uh, 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 right now uh, because we have not also, we, we don't really know uh, what effect. Uh, so we should measure it. I can see that now, especially when you ask. I see that it's very natural that we should have like a, but we can of course go back and, and see whether it has uh, had an effect. But I think also we are having a lot of discussions internally now that we want to uh, raise the ambition uh, in uh, communicating because of course in the beginning when you started January 2017 we started the real project and we when we visited now in January 2018 it was not until then that we felt safe also to know that it is really working and it's good so yeah we, we need to communicate better and then also we should be able to see some effect because it's also part of like uh what you say uh, building your your um, uh, brand in some way uh, yeah. so in that respect i think that it's difficult sometimes to measure but i'm sure that it is also in in the because doing nothing and then it will be revealed with this uh, quite horrible conditions and uh, we yeah we have to we have to work with it yeah but looking forward also as uh, when you are entering the phase two of this project to to have more information to have more more stories from your side on, on that case I, I would like now to ask a question to katie katie we have many uh members many companies who are listening and well would like to know how to start how to start working on women empowerment at the agricultural level what would be the the three things to start with from your perspective Thank you, Stephanie. Um, yes, I, I'm glad to hear that a lot of um, companies are listening and um, we would love to, I would love to chat with you all further and to talk about um, more solutions. But I think specifically on women and um, climate resilience to look at that act level and to look at um, what companies can do internally. Um, and there's a lot about aligning your uh, current policies um, and aligning to international frameworks um, and looking at ways to put a gender lens on your existing climate change policies um, to provide and providing women with gender sensitive trainings and inputs and financing, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot that can be done and uh, companies should take immediate steps internally to empower women to lead on climate resilience, um, but they also need to take a look at their own um, company structure and their uh, and their company strategy and sustainability strategy to figure out um, what makes most sense uh, for their particular particular company. Hmm. Thank you, Katie. We also have received quite a lot of questions on the I'm for a women's empowerment program. Uh, this webinar is not about that specific program that we launched. The, we have more information online. Maybe just one thing I'd like to say is one question was, but why only three countries for this program? Why not also Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on? Well, actually, the idea is that we start with three countries and there is training material that will be developed specifically uh, for at the factory level, at the farm level to empower women and the idea that it's then is possible to reuse in other countries later on. But for all those who want to know more about the Amphori Women Empowerment Program, I would like to invite you on one hand to look on the website for all the information available. And we also have Francis Wimmer, who is uh, this afternoon with, with us. You can find his uh, contact and asking for, for more questions. I think it's almost time for us to, for, to, to close this webinar. We could talk much longer about this issue. Um, it will anyway come again again uh, in the next month in in maybe in the at the conference maybe in one of the unleash opportunity forum because it's so critical but uh, first of all thank you to all our three speakers for for your contribution to this webinar for your time this afternoon thank you also to all our listeners this webinar has been recorded we will share it with you
as well as a different presentation PowerPoint that you saw. Do not hesitate to share this webinar and this, the, the PowerPoint with well, colleagues, with people around you. It's an important topic. It's important to share information about it. And if you want to know more about the work of Amphori, you can follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. That's also where you are going to be informed on the topic and the date of our next webinars. Thank you very much and have a very good afternoon. Thank you for listening to this Amphori Unleash Opportunity webinar. To learn more about Amphori and our activities, visit us at www.amphori.org or find us on LinkedIn and Twitter.